Dr. Kappel has uh, received multiple teaching awards and many grants of great value over his career. He has over 25 peer review publications. And I would say the last one uh, was something that Kelsey Musgrove helped with. And then, after I arrived, your computer speakers? Uh, no. uh, he had surveyed every hospital in the state. Uh, we were finally able to put that together as an assessment of the needs and the, and, and the resources available for surgeons in West Virginia. Uh, over 130 presentations. Uh, probably most importantly for this state, he has been a committed tireless uh, worker for our state trauma system, uh, helped in the development of it and was one of the founding uh, directors of development of the Rural Trauma Team Development Force of American College of Surgeons, uh, of which uh, Dr. Wilson has been the, the most recent chair. Uh, and he has been very instrumental in development of quality trauma care in this state uh, and really dedicated his professional life outside of the operating room to that. Uh, so uh, we're thrilled to have him with us this morning. Uh, so I want to uh, welcome Dr. David Kaplan. You should go to the people house. We'll use the elevator. <clears throat> Let me start by saying I'm um, rather intimidated to be here in front of you today. Uh, the list of uh, lecturers for the Zimmerman series over the years is sort of reads like a list of who's who in uh, American surgery. And um, I, would, I would hope that my being here reflects the values and the education I received here. As mentioned, I went here to undergraduate, started in 62, came to medical school in 66, having already decided I wanted a career in surgery. And uh, my memories of Dr. Zimmerman were that he was very tall, especially from my vertically challenged perspective, uh, somewhat aloof, and <clears throat> had an amazing repertoire of challenging questions for oral examination. I only uh, <clears throat> learned recently that we shared a common love and that was fly fishing. Uh, I've not been able to find a picture of Dr. Zimmerman fly fishing, but if anybody has it on their archives, I would add it to the slide deck, but couldn't come up with that. But we also share another common link and that is being married to remarkable women. This is his widow who lived well into her nineties long after he was gone and beloved by everybody. And this lady has made my career possible, raised children, get me out of trouble most of the time, and uh, in large part owe oh, what I've been able to do to her support. So when I re returned to Wheeling, as mentioned, to practice uh, reconstructive plastic surgery, Dr. Pollock and I came along a couple years later, twisted his arm, come back, and um, we came down and um, served as part-time faculty, but when Medicare rules caught up with us, they didn't like that too much, unless we stayed overnight. <clears throat> we retreated to full-time practice in Wheeling, but as you know, and as mentioned, um, we continued to come down, make presentations, to mentor residents and young faculty and stay involved. So, Buggered it up, stuck. All right. So you might ask, why have I picked this topic to share with you? 
as others have said, notably Dr. Pollack, when you get to be our age, we talk about history <clears throat> in large part because we've lived through a lot of it. Living being an important word. <clears throat> Changes inevitable, like death and taxes. But I think we have a choice. We can either be a passenger or we can help steer the course. So let's begin by analyzing where we are, and then we'll talk about how we got here. Uh, before I go too far though, important disclosure. These are my opinions, and of course, those are the resources that I have referenced, not necessarily the opinions of the Department of Surgery, I don't wanna get them in trouble, and um, offered sincerely as ongoing commitment to excellence in American medicine, and ongoing discussion towards that goal. Total national health expenditures now approaching $4 trillion. Not quite to 20% of gross national product, but headed there. How are we doing? Lowest life expectancy. Highest rate of avoidable deaths. Highest chronic disease burden. Suicide rates, overachievers. Do doctors come see us or do patients come see us? Not enough. Are there enough of us? No. And in spite of spending more on healthcare than any other country, these are our outcomes. Now, <clears throat> at the end, my references will be available and I'll share them with anybody that wants them, but. Let me acknowledge a well-worn copy of Paul Starr's Social Transformation of American Medicine. It was published in 1982. <clears throat> How many of you were born before 1982? Some, <laughs> certainly a minority. Um, and you might say, well, why do you reference a book this old? Well, the last chapter, Dr. Starr's predictions. And I think you will find that after 40 years, they're remarkably prescient. This is Dr. Starr, a fairly recent picture. He's a noted sociologist at Princeton and has other publications besides this one. Now, I'm going to read some quotes. I apologize for reading, but I think quotes should be verbatim. In that book, <clears throat> among many quotes in the final chapter is as follows, quote, the great irony is that the opposition of doctors and hospitals to public control of public programs set in motion entrepreneurial forces that may end up depriving both private doctors and local voluntary hospitals of their traditional autonomy, end quote. In addition, he predicted, quote, new distinctions will be need to be made between owning, managing, employed, and independent physicians. The rise of corporate medicine will re-stratify the profession. The key question will be the control over the appointment of managing physicians. If if the managers are accountable to doctors organized in medical groups, the profession may be able to achieve some collective autonomy within the framework of the corporation. Another key issue will be the boundary between medical and business decisions. When both medical and economic considerations are relevant, who will decide and which will prevail? He also quotes from a book by Johnson in 2000 called Healthcare AD 2000, quote, <clears throat> working at corporate headquarters, the statisticians will not be concerned about individual physicians' reactions. Their reports, however, will supply individual hospitals with results about physicians who are not measuring up. 
Senior management at the corporate level will constantly be mindful that the corporation's reputation comes first, end quote. Additionally, Starr went on to say, in the multi-hospital systems, centralized planning, budgeting, and personnel decisions will deprive physicians of much of the influence they are accustomed to exercise over institutional policy, end quote. And may I go on? He also said, quote, nonetheless, compared with individual practice, corporate work will necessarily entail a profound loss of autonomy. Doctors will no longer have as much control over such basic issues as when they retire. There will be more regulation of the pace, routines of work, and the corporation is likely to require some standard of performance, whether measured in revenues generated or patients treated per hour. He noted also, those who talked about healthcare planning in the 70s were now, were now in the 80s talking about healthcare marketing and the health center of one era was the profit center of the next. So I ask you, 40 years later, how good was his crystal ball? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> as to the question of how did we arrive here, I think it derives directly from trying to control the marketplace. It really began at the end of the 1800s with peddlers of so-called natural remedies. However, at the turn of the <clears throat> centuries into the 1900s, actual trained physicians began to practice. Many had been to Europe for their education. And it was more anatomical and scientific based medicine. The American culture began to appreciate the practical demonstration of science, communication, transportation, <clears throat> and they were more than ready to accept the science of medicine. Seizing the opportunity, physicians began to organize and their next step was building their own workshops, the doctor's hospitals. Until that time, hospitals have been a place for the chronically ill and the indigent, and they were largely avoided. Patients now were easily attracted to these new modern hospital environments. Surgeons carrying the banner of quality care organized into the American College of Surgeons in 1918, as you've heard. And they began to accredit hospitals, it became the certifying body. And they did not give that up until 1951. And I believe some of us feel that might have been a misstep. Now, following World War II, with the return of thousands of war veterans seeking education, work, and affordable housing, <clears throat> the federal government began a series of social initiatives, which they hoped would include providing some sort of health safety net. Labor unions have been pushing for health care coverage from their employers with minimal success. President Truman led an effort to provide national health care plan, <clears throat> but labeled by his opponents, including the AMA, as a socialistic overreach, and this was at a time when communism and the Cold War had heightened everybody's suspicions about government authority. The AMA poured more money into the fight. The pharmaceutical companies threw their financial resources behind it. And operating on the sidelines, of course, were the commercial insurance companies. Now, they would have been happy if the government paid for the indigent people but not their paying customers. Blue Cross had begun in 1929 with a plan to cover teachers in their region. And uh, Dr. Wilson's roots, Baylor, 
consider that slide for her. Uh, many hospitals soon follow the lead. And so now, now you had the hospitals, the physicians, the government and insurance companies vying for control over the marketplace. Perhaps the only thing that has changed in 80 years is that now on the sidelines are the physicians. Post-war policies resulted in growth, medical schools, university hospitals, and the public began to press for greater access to medical care during the liberal years of the 1960s. And this provided a more fertile political environment. President Kennedy started pushing for Medicare. Now, he didn't get it done, but it was signed into law in 1964 after his death. Federal dollars turned out to be a bonanza for physicians and hospitals. But as you would expect, with that came more and more regulations and paperwork. Private physicians are now confronted with the need to hire not just clinical assistants, but coders, billing clerks, and office managers. And in order to control costs, Many joined physician groups pursuing an economy of scale. The stage was set for the steady erosion and disappearance of private practice as insurance companies, hospitals, and the hospital systems seized on the opportunity to contract with physician groups and individual physicians. The workers were now in the factory. As healthcare expenditures began to outpace the growth of the economy, a variety of government bills were introduced. Steadily, insurance companies pared down the reimbursement to better align with Medicare rates. Managed care insurance companies flourished with a nod from President Nixon until the public exasperated by the encumbrances and restrictions to healthcare rebelled <clears throat> by shopping for different plans. In the meantime, the cost of healthcare in America steadily, steadily climbed. <clears throat> As out-of-pocket expenses fell, percentage that the government paid grew steadily. A public disengaged in large part from actually paying the bills directly, increased their consumption of healthcare services. A cursory glance at our healthcare expenditures suggests that it's just not sustainable. But for now, there's a lot of money in what has been now labeled the medical industrial complex. Enter the concepts of for-profit and not-for-profit hospitals, profit margin, and market share. These latter concepts are not just the purview of for-profit hospitals, but also non-profit hospitals. In 2016, seven of the top 10 most profitable hospitals in the country were not for profit. <clears throat> now the main distinction for, if you are aware of this, you're not aware of it between the two is that for-profit hospitals can go out and raise money, investment, et cetera. And they return um, earnings to their shareholders. Not for profits on the other hand, have to justify their tax status with local, state and federal government by uh, documenting what they do for communities. However, they tend to be located in areas with less poverty, higher incomes, and fewer uninsured patients. Neville Czar, Senior Vice President at Boston's based Steward Healthcare, they have some 3,500 physicians and 18 hospital campuses 
revealed their internal strategies in the 2017 interview. Their revenue cycle dashboard is updated every Monday morning. It shows point of service cash collections and patient eligibility for Medicaid coverage. Their financial performance is updated Q15 minutes on large screen TVs in the business offices. Shift gears a little bit. A standard principle in a manufacturing business is throughput. If you're an ED physician, you've already heard this throughput measure. To quote, manufacturing throughput time is the actual amount of time required for a product to pass through a manufacturing process. Manual tests have always had a high risk of human errors with high production and supply chain costs, time involved, and a compromise on quality to a greater extent, end quote. Inter-assembly lines. Ransom Olds actually invented the assembly line for his Olds, Oldsmobile car company. Uh, Henry Ford often is credited with inventing it, but he actually uh, came up with the idea of the moving platform so that the vehicles moved along for the next uh, piece of the assembly. Shift work has been around since the late 1800s with the advent of the Industrial Revolution. The invention of electricity and the light bulb made 24 hour work possible. And uh, at the beginning, work shifts were 12 hours at a time for two weeks in a row. Needless to say, there was a lot of work injury and the workers rebelled. <clears throat> That didn't change much until 1933 with the passage of the Wagner Act, where they set a minimum reimbursement standard and protected the shifts. And the eight hour shift was initiated. <clears throat> As you know, medicine was slow to uh, pick up on that. There's been a lot of debate and change over the years about work hours, not just for residents, but for faculty as well. That debate's not ended yet. We were talking about it last night and uh, at the Western Trauma meeting this year, uh, Dr. Moore has just stepped down as the editor of the Trauma Journal and Dr. Moya debated whether someone should be on all weekend as uh, coverage or whether they should be 12 hour shifts. I think Dr. Moore won, but at any rate, World War II and the rapid production of um, Warplanes, utilizing these same concepts, pushed the system even further. The more units of production against a fixed cost of labor obviously increased the profit margin. So <clears throat> the next obvious strategy was reduce labor costs. Enter robotics. GM introduced the robotic arm in 1961 and a fellow by the name of Scheinman in 69 created a six axis robot that can move parts and assemble parts as well. And so now artificial intelligence is built into our robots. Too far a reach as a comparison, you say? This is the title of a 2021 opinion piece by Deborah Goldman visiting fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and you can read the title for yourself. Doctor's Office Becomes an Assembly Line. So where are we with artificial intelligence in medicine? Today, most mid-sized manufacturers are improving throughput, energy consumption, and profit per hour with customized AI solutions. Eric Topols of Scripps Research highlights 3.3 areas of opportunity in medicine. Number one, human pathology exam combined with AI was better than either human exam or AI alone. Smartphone apps can now make dermatologic diagnoses. 
and it's hoped that AI will give healthcare professionals more time to spend with their patients. But I fear it may just push for greater throughput. The real promise or threat at this time is in image recognition. AI technologies already rival radiologists in examination and diagnosis of digital mammography and chest X-ray. And AI algorithms are now being used to predict survival in neuromuscular diseases and dementia. Enter the artificial intelligence palliative care plan. The marketplace is already in the game, of course. IBM recently inked a deal to sell off its Watson Health subsidiary medical artificial intelligence. And of course, private equity firm stepped up to buy it. All right, what about market share? Hospital systems have been following business chains and franchise models for decades. Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, not to mention all the fast food chains, have a proven track record of market takeover in communities all across the country. Humana, one of the largest hospital chains, begun in 1968, and at the time its president said, the firm wants to provide a uniform and reliable product as a McDonald's hamburger coast to coast. He did not go on to define quality product, i.e. patient care. And interestingly now, restaurant chains are trying to escape the stigma of chains. Um, they still have the same corporate structure, but they want to be seen as unique to the community. Hospital systems, however, continue to pursue the Walmart model, even in the face of unique cultural and community identities in the populations they serve. Richard Gunling, Senior Vice President, Healthcare Financial Management Association, quoted in a 2017 article predicted, for profits will look for management and acquisition opportunities in rural areas. Nonprofits will look for smaller, mid sized hospitals in different regions and focus on those. <clears throat> Again, the corporate business strategies between the two, for profit and nonprofit, are essentially the same. Everybody's looking for the so called economy of scale. He went on to say, focusing on increasing value to patients and purchasers is a no-fail strategy. But once again, no definition of value. We'll return to that a little later. <clears throat> One only has to turn on the TV or access the internet briefly to be confronted by the omnipresent marketing tools, advertisements for healthcare facilities, pharmaceuticals, healthcare services, technology, and prior to the 1980s, <clears throat> advertising medicine was frowned upon. The AMA prohibited it. We went through that era. But the US Federal Trade Commission began to scrutinize the ban and that soon went away. In a review in 2019 in JAMA, this explosive growth in medical marketing was analyzed. And I think the numbers are important. In 20 years from 1997 to 2016, it had increased from 17.7 billion to 29.9 billion. The most rapid rise in direct to consumer marketing from 17 billion to 19 to 29.9 billion. Um, direct drug advertising from 1 billion to 6 billion. Direct marketing from 500 million to 2.9 billion, a five fold increase. And perhaps, perhaps the most ethically troubling component 
That's a twofold increase in direct marketing to healthcare professionals from 15.6 billion to 20.3 billion. That's a lot of free lunches and dinners and speaking engagements. As you can see, a dedicated advertising industry has emerged there to quote, help with communicating to present and future patients. A recent article in BMC Health Research, they conclude, advertising if well devised and deployed offers healthcare providers opportunities to dramatically improve their fortunes by successfully engaging current and prospective patients. Hastening exchange and building vital market share. Now, aside from increased longevity and population growth, increasing market share must mean that moving into somebody else's territory. In doing that, it's incumbent upon us to see that we provide better product, i.e. patient care and outcomes. So let's shift to outcomes. There's a great deal of emphasis on outcomes and their measures at this time in medicine in America. With the incredible amount of money being paid the medical industrial complex, all sorts of entities are trying to define the value of the product purchase. Chris Ganey scores, as seen here, measured by Likert scale, generally for each survey turned in, revolve around the same sorts of numbers and reflect in general how much the patient liked the physician. Now that may not be all that bad an outcome. Anyway, as expected, it's proprietary and it comes with cost. Now, appropriately, there's a shift away for just paying for procedures, which has exposed us to a vulnerability of overuse of technologies and tools for every nail for the several hammers we have waiting to be used. The health maintenance organizations, of course, have battled this over the years with limited success. But as alluded to earlier, employed physicians, productivity and RVUs are tallied and connected to salaries and bonuses which I submit also raises a serious ethical question. So where are we now? It's outside forces <clears throat> and, and measures um, look us over. A recent review by Health Catalyst looked at the seven hospital measures used by CMS and their relative weighting. <clears throat> Efficient use of medical imaging, perhaps not doing quite as well as we hoped, but other than mortality and readmissions, there's not a lot here in terms of outcomes, certainly as regards quality of life as measured by the patient. These seem to still be missing. Now, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, a private nonprofit organization founded in 1991 to improve healthcare worldwide, submitted their list as the triple aim of healthcare improve patient experience, improve the overall public health, reduce per capita cost. And I think very importantly now, as we try to come out of the pandemic, reduce clinician and staff burnout, and maintain our workforce. <clears throat> I would submit, however, patient quality of life outcomes still appear to be missing. Thankfully, our palliative care colleagues are leading the way with more patient-centric focus of care and developing goals measured more appropriately by the patient as they assess the quality of their life as they proceed through the evolution of treatment. 
Uh, it may have been an initiative strongly influenced by the dollars Medicare was spending on the last six months of life in patients' existence. But nevertheless, it has revealed that we have an ongoing communication issue between physicians and patients and what patients want out of treatment. I would guess you're happy to hear this, but the line always goes in preparation for closing. And the audience says, well, hopefully. At any rate, I'm going to insert some personal opinions. To this point, most of it's been from my resources. The practice of medicine in America may now be evidencing some symptoms of chronic progressive heart disease. The evolution of the complex organism known as healthcare steadily becomes more and more data and information driven and its compassionate center shrinks. Ever since the invention of the, of the stethoscope, practitioners have been moving away from the proximity of the patient. I've locked it up again, Nate. Oh. I'll let you. Thanks. You know, before the stethoscope, the examiner put his ear or her ear on the patient's chest and auscultated the heart and breath sound. Now, granted, the technology of the stethoscope certainly improved the exam. But it began a steady retreat from the proximity of the patient. Invasive laboratory tests were developed. And they required time for analysis and interpretation. Next was the development of invasive treatments, good old surgery, which ostensibly required emotional detachment to perform. As the scientific approach to medicine became more and more advanced, the practitioner became more and more disengaged and the patient more and more the bug in the jar. Now, as you know, tools are available for endoscopic procedures, robotic surgery interpreted on television screens, computer technology inserted between the healthcare practitioner and their patient. And there's no practical software at the moment to translate emotions through time and space, such as fear and anxiety. Unfortunately, this model of detached objectivity has led to a need now to teach empathy, compassion, and concern often in what amounts to rather sterile academic terms. I submit we as a profession must reverse the tide. Dynamic open dialogues between physicians and patients must be developed. The way in which information is provided to patients is equally as important as to the facts as are the facts that are being presented. Remember the old saying, patients don't care so much about how much you know, but how much you care. Effective practitioners are able to communicate a depth of sensitivity and compassion. This does not happen without demands on the practitioner in terms of time, emotions, and imagination, and energy. It calls for attention to and understanding the patient's perception, in addition to defining and treating their illness. The structure of our healthcare culture must redefine, be redefined so it will not only provide time, but it will provide reimbursement or necessary dialogue, connection, most importantly, a mutual respect between patients and practitioners. Less attention should be focused on protocols and policies and more on the provision of the generosity of spirit. 
This generosity entails a willingness to suffer with your patient. And it needs to be an evolving, let me underline evolving human trait for caregivers. Those encounters which involve dialogue and a shared narrative will develop the ethical space. And only through that shared ethical space of empathy, compassion, and shared suffering can we restore the moral compass of the healthcare profession. Institutional and hierarchical separation must be minimized. Power, position, and ego must be subjugated before the well being of patients and their families. May Starr's other prediction of 1982 not come true. Quote Young doctors may be more interested in freedom from the job than freedom in the job. And organizations that can provide more regular hours and screen out the invasions of private life that come with independent professional practice, end quote. However, in 2020, the AMA voted into being a new private practice physician section. To stem the tide, and Dr. Kathleen Blake, leader at the time, noted, the hospital acquisition of practices has, quote, led to modestly, modestly worse patient experiences and no significant changes in rehabilitation or mortality rates, end quote. Additionally, an environment of spiritual comfort and a sense of home and family must be cultivated, not obstructed or sterilized by the architects of corporate image. Providing a sense of home through an environment that ex provides the experience of being at home generates a sense of shelter, nurture, and refuge. Refuge. The patient needs to feel support by caregivers, family, and friends. And this sense of family and home must be intrinsic to the therapeutic setting. We have all witnessed the first, have witnessed firsthand the obstruction of this by the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting destructive effects on patients, families, and healthcare providers alike. All dimensions of the clinical space should be considered an appointment for care as an outpatient or an inpatient stay should be synonymous with coming home and all that implies. What can we do? I consider myself a sympathetic listener, but I do insist on one thing. If you come to complain, you best bring a solution with you. As my neighbor says, don't just sit up in the cheap seats and offer criticism. So how do we retake our identity, both individually and as a profession? Physicians have always shied away from the word strike, but in 2002, in the West Virginia liability insurance crisis, the threat of treating only life and limb emergencies and shutting down elective admissions and procedures was certainly an attention getter. And the pandemic did essentially that and brought hospitals everywhere to their financial needs. No assembly line been, likes being stopped or slowed. Now, let me emphasize, I am not advocating such draconian measures, but we must, however, demand a seat at the corporate table where financial decisions are made that impact medical care and the sociologic health of our communities. As Carl Hauser said in his Western Trauma Presidential Address, the first law of business is this. If you're not at the table, 
you're on the menu. And as I said in the Hamilton, we need to be in the room where it happens. We should be crafting the image of physicians, not advertising agencies. We need to reclaim the image of physicians as compassionate and caring and not super docs. Gratitude from patients should reflect our care, not the team uniform or logo, because without us, there is no corporation. For a long time, I have thought healthcare institutions should be directed by a business person and a respected practicing physician where their strengths and weaknesses would balance each other out. We understand data and should insist on proper outcomes, ever mindful of the triple aim plus one of improved patient experience, satisfaction, public health, cost, and keeping the workforce. And lately being disenchanted with national, international institutions that have a singular person at the top of the pyramid, I now feel strongly there should probably be a troika, three at the top, at least a tiebreaker. And that should represent fully equity and inclusion. And finally, we should redirect our focus from healthcare systems to systems of caring. And I thank you, and I'll take any pushback, rebuttal, or whatever. So, as I said, my references are available. So, uh, Dr. Cavill, that was uh, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Cavill? Uh, not, a, not a question, but a comment. And I really appreciate the perspective and some of the history of Marilow. Uh, I think another thing that you and I have spoken about, we talk about burnout and burnout amongst, we're seeing more and more burnout at younger and younger ages. And I, I think you and I both agree that a lot of that has to do with the fact that people feel more like a cog in the wheel as opposed to truly being a physician. And so one of the things that I try to tell young people when I say that physician medicine during surgery, you gotta think of it as a vocation, not a physician. One of the greatest challenges that we're seeing now is these big systems and corporations that balance between having shifts to that loss of continuity. So the three of us were able to reflect on patients, and I know Dr. Mark says, patients that we've seen over 20 years that we've helped, whereas I think that's now becoming more and more unusual for many people in big systems. So even for a short period of time for one to see the problem and then they never see it again. And then on the medicine side, you see all that through all these subspecialists where the things don't get integrated, the patient may be very confused about what the right thing is for their healthcare system. Hominology is one thing, cardiology is another, endocrine is another, and then they end up with a polypharmacy. Um, yeah, and that's where I put in a plug for um, community practice. Um, 
40 years plus in one community, you have all these shared narratives with families and patients, right? And you run into them over and over again in the community, not necessarily in the clinic, but they want to share that piece of their story, which is part of your story as well. And thinking while you're talking, it's almost like those are the booster shots that protect us against the pandemic of burnout in medicine. Will there be burnout and changes in careers? Yeah, and sometimes that was unrealistic expectations going into medicine, but at the root of it all, helping patients. We, we make almost a shameful good income from helping people who are critically ill, chronically ill, maimed or injured. And, and that is a gift, but it's also a grave responsibility. And giving part of ourselves to the patients is revered by patients and families. Dr. Moore, in his part of the debate, showed Christmas cards that he got from patients, his lives that he had saved along the way. And that uh, being on call all weekend, you got to see him come in, go through the OR, get resuscitated, and then hopefully on Monday morning, go to a step-down unit. But he lived that struggle with the patient. Um, is it hard? Is it wearing and tiring? Yeah. But again, it's 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 a real privilege to have the gifts that you were provided with, your brain, your stick to itiveness, the education, uh, and you repay that one patient at a time. In my opinion. Yeah, that's what I was going to Right. Yeah, if you want to make a lot of money, you know, be a private equity firm, push stocks around, whatever. But politicians will tell you doctors show up in DC, and the first thing they want to talk about is reimbursement rates. And they get turned off pretty quick. So, um, I just a, a quick anecdote that um, I think is still holds true for the residents and students. You know, the continuity of care is a remarkable thing, and it's it's a uh, it, it it can be that thing that keeps you going. I, I was always struck. I think it's still true today that the the turnover of nursing uh, was the least in the burn unit. Uh, and these are some of the hardest patients to take care of, and they're there for the longest, but the relationships that the nurses built with them were some of the strongest, and I think that you see that on the surgical side of the house even here uh, with the, the, the uh, relationships that nurses build with our trauma patients, trying to get them through to get them out. Uh, I think that, that speaks to you know the trauma night of recognition and everyone who is involved, and so you know that continuity is often in and, and it is you know, adversely impacted with the way the residencies are structured today and the way the services are staffed today, that uh, there, it's very hard to, to see the fruits of your hard work. 
um, which you know gets back to well, why clinic is there. So, uh, Dr. Kappel, I just want to thank you very much. It was fantastic having you. We appreciate you being here. Uh, before we wrap this up, we just have one more little thing to do. I ask Dr. Wilson to come up. Dr. Pollock. Okay. So um, many of you I don't know really fully understand the impact that these two gentlemen have had within the state of West Virginia. So when they came as young surgeons, we had no state trauma system. There was no state trauma designation. There were no trauma centers. And in fact, the whole reason why our trauma center exists is because Senator Byrd's grandson was injured in a car accident alongside one of the interstates, and there was no organized system, uh, no planned uh, ways to, to access people. You know, EMS was in its early founding times, and, and he died most likely of very, very survivable injuries. And so the, the system started, but it wasn't really a system. It was sort of people just doing it. But, but these two gentlemen really were the ones who really worked, you know, it's plastic and reconstructive surgeons. And they read, led the charge through the entire state. And in fact, when we were really trying to build a state system, they took an RV around to every single hospital in the state and did their state, their uh, hospital assessment their trauma readiness assessment, uh, and really gave that report to the college. And, and nationally within the Committee of Trauma, they are so respected for what they have done for improving the care of trauma uh, for the rural trauma patients. You know, many of the big urban centers have large professional EMS groups, uh, but they've really helped set the standard for uh, what, what is now other states are, are looking at. And when we had the healthcare crisis in West Virginia years ago, there was a, a issue because malpractice awards were so high, we couldn't keep physicians here. And these are the people that worked with the legislature that crafted and got the tort reform, which put the pain and suffering malpractice cap for all emergency procedures linked to maintaining your state trauma verification. So that shows you how important trauma and emergency care was in the state. And to this day, Dr. Kappel still like is enslaved to all of us as he goes around trying to do the same and help with STEMIs and strokes and everything else. And there's really about three people in the state who continue to carry the banner. With that too, um, back oh, probably close to 15, 20, year, 20 years ago, probably, there was recognition that most hospitals in rural areas don't have general surgeons who are comfortable with a lot of trauma. And a lot of them don't even have a surgeon in many areas. And you have family physicians, APPs, et cetera. And so what they did was they helped develop a particular course. And remember at that time, ATLS was for doctors only. APPs could not take ATLS. Now that's changed, but just in the last like five to seven years. So they developed a course called the Rural Trauma Team Development Course. That course is now taught internationally. Um, it's now an American College of Surgeons course, but the first course was actually held here in Summersville, West Virginia. Uh, so really their impact on the, on the state on the nation and internationally. And I'll tell you, RTC is taught almost on a daily basis that and stop the bleed in Ukraine. Um, and is really helping teach non-trauma, non-surgery patient people how to manage trauma. So this was the hundredth year of the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. And they put together these really nice books. So, and with that, Dr. Kappel and Dr. Pollock helped us contribute to the rise of uh, and the beginnings of the Rural Trauma Team Development Course and contributed to a chapter. Um, and with that then, uh, they, we also had these books. So these were signed by the uh, current committee members of the Rural Trauma Team Development Course. And so as a gift to you both for all that you've done, we wanted to present these to you and thank you for your work and dedication. And, 
I think they really embody the statement of, you know, we see great horizons because we stand on the shoulders of giants. And I don't think people really realize what they've done. So thank you. But you gotta love them. If you ever go to our state symposium, so we'll sit around the little fire pit at night, and it's like during the state symposium when we do our things, it's like listening to the Muppets, you know, the old guys in the corner of the Muppets. <laughs> yeah, they're hysterical to listen to, and then you'll then you'll be around the fire and they'll be like, no, stop talking. So, ah, <laughs> they're a lot of fun too. I was gonna put the video on at the end of Waldorf Sattler, but I was right. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. This concludes uh, our gray rounds. We were very grateful for Dr. Kappel's participation today. Uh, we will take a short break and then revisit some uh, case presentations for Dr. Kappel by our residents, uh, give everyone a chance to check in with their faculty. So thank you. <laughs>